What is up, Dragon Ball Super Card Gamers? I am Jonic Tull. You may know me as Joku DMD from my own YouTube channel, The Joku Shoku. Uh, first and foremost, I want to give a very special thank you to Brian Brown. Brian, thank you for including me in this. Thank you for running the stream for Nationals. I appreciate you taking the time to reach out and ask me a couple questions, and I would love to answer them. So I have these questions from Brian here, and I'm going to just run through them and answer them. What is your name and where are you from? Well, I just answer my name. I am Jonic Tull. That's how you say my name. It rhymes with Sonic. It's a hard J. You may have seen it on the discussion group a lot. I post a lot of my own videos in the discussion group. I'm from Princeton, New Jersey, and I'm a dentist. I love shiny cardboard and I love shiny teeth and I love pe helping people have shiny smiles. So I started playing in the summer of 2018. I've been going to Japan since I was a kid. And after college, I started going more regularly. I found out about the Dragon Ball Heroes card game and I started using Dragon Ball Heroes art to uh, make clothing and shoes and stuff. And I was at Comic-Con and I was waiting to play the Super Smash Brothers demo and this guy saw my shoes and he was like, yo, sweet shoes. And I was like, thanks, that's UI Goku from the Dragon Ball Heroes card game, which is right behind me, the card's right back there. But they have this awesome Dragon Ball card game over there called the Dragon Ball Super Card Game. Have you heard of it? And he was like, yeah, it's awesome. Have you played it? And I was like, no. And he was like, you should play it. It's really cool. So I ended up playing it and really liking it. And that was in about 2018. And it's just been a wonderful experience ride since then. I've made so many friends. Um, the next question is, oh, a funny little tidbit. Actually, the guy that I met in line, I ended up playing him online like a year later in a uh, on untap and we like figured out that it was each other it was really cool so my biggest accomplishment in dbs is actually kind of outside of just dbs i uh went to comic-con in new york and got to meet masako nozawa the voice of goku and i happened to have my deck in my backpack because i was going to go to atlantic city to play in the arg regionals which was my first regional i ever played in and i was playing the uh uh the the goku from the ultimate box um, and I had the signature T.O.P. Goku in there and I had Masako Nozawa sign that signature T.O.P. Goku and I was wearing a t-shirt with the Awakened Power on it that I made and uh, they were taking a bunch of pictures of us and we did a Kamehameha together and there's a picture of me doing some kind of pose while she was signing my card and about two years or a year later when I went to go see the Dragon Ball Super Broly movie in Japan I uh, went because I really wanted to get these newspapers. They have these newspapers and I got one of the newspapers and a few months later, the newspaper was just sitting up here in my attic. I actually have one right over there, but I was nailing some pages of the newspaper to my ceiling. As you see, I have lots of stuff nailed to my uh, walls here. And as uh, I was nailing one of the pages on it, I saw myself in one of the pictures and uh yeah so i got into the dragon ball super broly newspaper in japan while i was getting my signature top signed by masako nozawa over sean shemmel's signature wearing an awakened power t-shirt doing a kind of goku-ish pose so i would say that was probably probably my biggest dragon ball accomplishment ever um but then also revealing the goku frieza secret rare was really really cool shout out to evan u7 evan if you're watching this DBS is the first card game I've ever played. I play it purely because of the intellectual property, but I found fell in love with the game after playing it. My favorite colors are blue and yellow, if that isn't really obvious from everything that I do, and my favorite colors to play in the game are blue and yellow. I'm more of a blue player. I do like yellow. I prefer a little bit of yellow in blue, but I do have fun playing yellow with blue in it as well. It's actually how I got my invite to Nats, was playing yellow, blue, Broly at the Chicago Regionals. I got fourth place. In 2019 if you ended up in the finals who would be the toughest person to go against this is an extremely easy question it would 100% be Johnny Teo if I ended up playing Johnny Teo in the finals it would be the most heart-wrenching difficult uh, uh, emotional and combative matchup of my life and so our plan is to be first and second and play each other in the finals I'm ready I'm ready I'm prepared to win because I want to manifest that energy but regardless just going to this event is a win in itself so I'm just excited to have fun this weekend this is actually an interesting question I think not as much like there's so much potential in the game I'm not a great game designer so I'm not going to sit here and say like I have some great idea I think it would be have a be a funny card like if a card decked somebody out by adding cards from their deck to their life I think that would be funny but it'll also be just kind of meme heavy but 
I'm more interested in something kind of outside of the game. I'm interested in every person that knows about Dragon Ball knowing about the Dragon Ball Super card game because this card game is so amazing. It's so beautiful. And I know every single Dragon Ball fan I've talked about, I kind of like scream Dragon Ball when I run around. If you see what I look like, like I, it's not hard to know that I'm a Dragon Ball fan. And I think everybody that likes Dragon Ball deserves to know about this game because it's so beautiful. It's so fun. It's so cool to look at. It's an absolute work of art. I'm, I, if you've listened to anything that I put on the internet, I frequently say that I think that this is basically modern day Japanese woodblock printing. Uh, and I think that it's something that everybody should know about that likes Dragon Ball. So my life mission as Joku DMD is to spread the Dragon Ball Super Card game to the world and show every Dragon Ball fan that I meet how cool this game is and really if you just show them a card from the collector section selection it's pretty much gg because those cards just look insanely good so that's pretty much it i'm excited to see everybody at nats if you're watching this uh whoever is doing awesome congratulations to you i think it should be a really really fun weekend huge shout out to my boy steve he's gonna be recording so much this weekend we're gonna be vlogging as much as possible so make sure to check out that and uh, good luck to everybody. Gambateo! Thank you, Dragon Balls! So much power, so much wind condition, and you still have a ton of options if uh, on the back. But if you don't, mm -hmm. uh, otherwise it's just a uh, pay one. You can untap four and draw two. Like it, it has a lot of versatility, especially in this type of format that is going five, six, seven, eight turns. Yep, absolutely. And here we go, Kinosov Janak going for the turn one blue yellow charge, uh, indicating to us that that is definitely the build that he's going with. And actually, that Vegeta and Kaba is an incredibly good card. With the follow up from David here going for his searches, and actually, I do think Mickey, Kub uh, Mickey Kubura is a deck that actually enjoys going second. Mm -hmm. because the hand advantage difference between a Mickey deck that goes first versus second is astronomically different. Correct. Uh, yeah, this deck is one of the most consistent. And, you know, we just had this conversation with Brian, and he talked about how he sees so many cards. This, uh, the Dark Empire Strikes Back. Apparently, Dave Fujimori is also a Star Wars fan. Um, but he plays a ton of cards that are two copies or three copies because he knows he's going to see them all. And we're going to see that throughout the format today. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, consistency throughout, throughout. Just... The ability to see monster deck, and I, like you and Eggman were talking about, you know, these decks, not only being wish decks, want to be running more than 50, you know, 50 cards. You're looking at 56, 57, anything like that when it comes to these lists specifically. Um, but these are these the type of decks that will be able to go and see through most of it. Yeah. Uh, especially these consistency pieces like these one-drop Toas that find you the salsas and shrooms that you want at any point given time in the deck. Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly. So if I am the Soul Striker deck, you know, of course, my goal is to play Unison on turn three, and I, I built my cards all around it. Uh, past that, uh, I need to make sure I'm charging mono blue cards turn two and turn three. Mm -hmm. So once I awaken, my leader has the ability of when I attack, I can untap two of my energy. So I need to make sure, and you're gonna see that continuous with these blue and yellow decks. We're actually also seeing a couple blue red. I'm excited to hopefully yeah. see those later in the mm -hmm. event as well. Yeah, very exciting. A couple of uh, one in Focus style build, another arrival build, very interesting. And it just goes to show the flexibility of Soul Striker. You know, while it is very much monocolor focus in terms of what you can untap, um, you're also in blue. So Bean helps a lot in terms of, hey, do I need another Another red or another yellow going into uh, the rest of my turn? That's fine. We'll just bean it out and be able to get it again. Gameplay here being a little bit slower. It, it seems like Janek is a little unfamiliar with this uh, Mechi Kabura archetype. So he's making sure he's reading all his cards. Uh, the unique niche of this deck is it can, it can manage the opponent's drop area. While we do have a decent number of cards that have the capacity of doing that, they're not too mainstream. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, it, it forces the opposing player to really time out um, any of their drop cards, right? Like, Soul Striker loves playing Saiyan Instincts. Mm -hmm. It's basically a free plus two if you got nothing else to do on your turn. Mm -hmm. um, so timing that right so that you use it when you throw it in drop is a huge uh, huge thing to account for. Because now if you're arriving early on your, or defensively on your opponent's turn, if you don't time it right with Mechie, they can get rid of it. And now that plus two that you were banking on, well, that's gone. Exactly. So we see the Kai drop, which is one of the more unique cards in the... Uh... In, in the deck right now has a unique characteristic of when the opponent plays cards on your turn they have to bottom deck a card 
So it's it's a it's a way to manage the opponent's hand in a color that normally isn't fantastic at. Yeah, absolutely, and it's almost for turn. Um, so against some decks, it is super pushing in terms of uh, forcing your opponent to have to deal with it, and having to deal with a, a lowly 4K <laughs> one drop is never a great way to deal with your premium removal. Indeed. So we see David with his leader swing. He got an opportunity to evaluate his life. Um, he's pulled two of his Dragon Balls. Looks like that's one Yearning and one Dark Empire. Yeah, getting that early cycle. Um, and we do see the play of the Houston. And I, I do see this uh, Bardock being uh, kind of a contentious choice. Some black players completely off of it. Mm -hmm. Some of them, you know, really praising the ability to have a two cost unison that draws you a card every turn. So I think it very much depends on whether you're going for a bit of a faster build, which mm -hmm. can obviously opt it out. I think Brian Samuel definitely leaning off of those kind of cards. He did, he did. Yeah, yeah. but uh, for this one, I do believe that David is going for a bit of a longer term play in terms of how he's going to play out there. And that's what I love about this. Two teammates that decide, I want to play the same deck. I want to play the same gist, mm -hmm. uh, but respecting the other people's choices. I, I, I understand why you're playing or not playing this card. I have a different philosophy. And it's going to be interesting to see how their results over the course of the tournament uh, differentiate based on those few cards. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it, that's the beauty is that you can definitely mold these decks to play to your strengths. Um, there are so many uh, different techs that you can include in or the way that you can play these because uh, like a leader like Mechacabra definitely leans itself to being either or. You can either go really fast or if you're going a bit slower, it has some powerhouse finishers to really um, give you payback on being patient. So yeah. you can definitely lean those strategies to either what your playstyle is and both of the players are doing incredibly well with the decks. So mm -hmm. it just goes to show itself throughout the tournament. Yeah. David beginning to explain how some of the cards work, choosing the combo away the Kai. Uh, realizing that Kai, this isn't necessarily the deck that Kai is going to get a lot of leverage in. Uh, there is a Supreme Kai of Time counter uh, counter attack uh, that there are two copies of. That card could actually, uh, you know, punish or East Kai could punish that card. But mm -hmm. he, he's making the right call. It's not going to get a whole bunch of value. Yeah, there's not that much usage here. Uh, Yearning of the Dark Empire also just just gets rid of it, um, which that card does do something as much as people forget. So yeah. th 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 there's a multiple ways Salsa could get rid of like this, or, uh, or Shroom as well. Like th There's a number of cards here that deal with it. So if anything, Janak here probably just using it for the cycle and then good to go here. I mean, we see the additional one in hand, just get rid of it because you know you're not going to get much usage out of it. So. Exactly. One of the unique niches is this Mechi Cabrera deck also takes some, some ideas from the Shroom and Salsa leader. Uh, so we're seeing some of these vanillas in the deck uh, that try to evolve into the five drops. Mm -hmm. So it'll be exciting to see. Uh, they definitely had a lot of impact in uh, in game three of uh, the last set. Uh, we'll see if that has the same outcome here. Yeah, it's an amount of pressure. Um, for the um, uninitiated, you wouldn't expect the amount of pressure that a Black Witch deck is able to push, but especially the Dark Demon Realm cards uh, lend themselves to being very efficient. They cost one for 15 and 20k beaters, and they chain into uh, additional Demon Realm, uh, Realm cards. So it definitely pushes itself to being good aggro uh, that you can't actually expect when you just look at the cards in uh, first glance. And those are the decks that, that a, a champion competing player wants. They want to be able to have control at every point in the game. And I'm sure that's why you love Yellow Sin Shenron, because you can go very fast. You can try to say, game two, either your life's going to be zero or my life is zero. Or you can say, I'm going to wait six, seven turns, build a huge board, yeah. and go in control wise. Absolutely. The, the, the crown for any competitive player's options and knowing what tree, uh, you know, what branches are the best to take to get you to the path of victory. And uh, that's what we're seeing here on this play with uh, Fuji going through the deck, being able to pull out a uh, Demon Realm, going for the pick, and then uh, I don't know if he's going to extend the play too much here, but uh, definitely setting himself up uh, for some longevity here. Mm -hmm. That Darkness Judgment is energy also being one of the free defensive options that this deck has. Black traditionally is not great on defense. No. They uh, play a lot of things for free or for low cost, but they, they do not have the floodgates. They don't have the violent rays and the heroic mm -hmm. prospects that we see other colors have. Yeah, so here having access to a sense of being, which a lot of decks, their strategy is to go wide against black because like you're saying, black doesn't have all that many great tools, you know? Protected the people maybe, but even then you're losing a card. So definitely makes it a little bit tougher. But here we will see the baby unison come down, allowing Soul Striker to awaken early. Uh, and now I, I want to say Janak is fully online at this point. Correct, the deck is functioning as intended. Um, do we see a second baby in his energy? Uh, potentially there is God Seal. So we'll have to see once he straightens those up because, you know, most likely he's going to swing yeah. his leader, get that little untap. And uh, yeah, I believe that is a baby. Baby the Unknown Parasite being infamous for that relationship with uh, baby five drop eight. 
Golden Avenger, mm -hmm. uh, being able to say, you know, I my, a my leader's a win condition now, and if you try to stop it, I'm just gonna play a bigger threat. Mm -hmm. So it'll be exciting to see if Janik is doing that or if he's pivoting towards other uh, other cards. Yeah. Anytime you include this unison is definitely something that you have to consider, um, especially since Baby is ready to proc off his ultimate from one singular tick, mm -hmm. and being at a five marker unison, oftentimes people just ignore it which is very dangerous because then you have the, you know, God Seal alive the entire time and just the multitude of options that Blue has once you have a big ceiling uh, unison like that. Yeah, one of two leaders in the, two unisons in the game that can uh, plus two that are, are as big as this. Uh, the other one, of course, being Dark Broly. Uh, and those are two of the most represented decks. Yep, there's, pro <laughs> there's probably a reason why. Yeah, probably, they do pretty good. Calamity Challenger, one Whoa. of my favorite cards from the previous set. Uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, the card has Deflect, which means it's reliably hitting the field. But for one energy, he's playing it, he's drawing a card, and he's either applying pressure or having a block. Yeah, and you have some phenomenal options in terms of his Activate Main, where you can swap out for a 6-drop. Um, you know, if he is playing it, Dragon Fist is available there to be able to uh, untap. Um, but also, having a 4-drop blue card on board actually synergizes with a number of things that blue is looking to do. Uh, you know, the, the UI engine could utilize it. Um, so now, it's left David to think about, okay, so what are we about to see here? What does this card represent for me if it's not just value? And that's something that he's going to have to contemplate here as he's lining up his defenses. Correct. Ooh, he hit right. quite early. That, that's oh. more than we usually see. Oh. All right, we're all right. We're reconsidering it. That's fine. But that is information that, that Janak has now. Data, <laughs> data downloaded. Yeah. Ooh. I will say though, as an SCR choice, Kai is extremely good against Blue because if they God Seal it, that's fine. You're just gonna play one more and mm -hmm. it's gonna come back. Um, so it is one of the SCRs that is uh, relatively tough for Blue to deal with, just because of how easy it is for it to come back on board. Mm -hmm. Deborah Ritual with Hand actually making it to the main deck of of David. He's really afraid of self, self <laughs> team one. And that's what Brian was saying too. It's the one matchup he's afraid of. Uh, so they main deck a couple copies of it and hopefully they get some value out of it. Yeah, absolutely. And here we see Kai is hitting board now. So it's starting to do it proactively instead of defensively. Uh, makes sense. Give your opponent the least amount of time to be able to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Have the additional energy if you absolutely feel like you need to get it, uh, get it out way, which this is most likely a way to deal with the unison. Um, the power level of the deck definitely lowering down much more if you lose the unison. So. Mm -hmm. Janik making a little bit of what some people would call a risky play here. That's saying Instinct's gonna go to the drop area. It has to last in the drop area for the entirety of the turn. Yeah, but here we oh. see that's right by Kai and it leaves the game. And that is a surefire way of making sure. No, no, you know what? Yeah. My, my board's gonna stay. Yeah. I don't I don't approve of this. And this yeah. might actually be what David was trying yeah. to avoid when he opted to not go for it defensively, not yeah. give Janak the ability to go for that play. There's no way he has two sensu beans. And <laughs> He says, I'm throwing these sensu beans down with lightning speed. Yeah. <laughs> As that lightning speed SS2 Kefla hits the board. Uh, one of the, the strongest and probably one of the prettiest cards uh, from Saiyan Showdown as well. Um, he's going to have the ability, if it gets back to his turn, to be able to draw cards, to be able to tap David's energy. Uh, David definitely has to consider all the aspects of this card and how to circumvent it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's an amazing threat. It's phenomenal defensively. Um, and it provides a ton of value. So on the untap here, it could be very dangerous because now he's facing a lot of pressure. Um, you know, he could start dealing with board uh, as well as buying pressure on the leader. So it, it's a very dangerous card. And, you know, multiple values of uh, Keflin Hand just mean that she's going to be able to go wild with that dual attack. David looking at his hand again. One of the big things he has to contemplate is does he use all his energy this, this turn? Lightning Speed has the ability where he can uh, discard a card to be able to gain dual attack. Uh, however, uh, Kefla can also tap an energy if it discards a copy of itself. Mm -hmm. However, it's not the easiest card to get in your hand. You're not really searching it or yeah. tutoring it. Uh, so he has to ask, what are the chances of him having the second one? Mm. I mean, and probably decently likely, seeing as it's you know, four of in the deck, I'm sure. Um, but here, the Toa is going to do clean work and just say, I'm going to come in and I'm going to deal with it. Um, here we see Janak using the God Seal. And here we are. I believe we're just, yeah, they're going to get rid of the Kefla here. So forcing David to tap out, however, to be able to get that Kefla off board. Mm -hmm. Definitely still an even footed match. Uh, only being at four markers. Um, you know, that, that be, and, and with uh, Supreme Kai time at the bottom of the deck, unless David's able to get a nice shuffle and a nice draw. 
that unison is staying. Mm -hmm. uh, it's there, uh, especially now that the kite is gone, gone. So now it's going to be uh, in terms of attacking into it, maybe. And then, oh, oh, right. Yeah, it got removed. Yeah, and the, the leader can do a decent job at that. If it mm -hmm. decides triple attack and David decides he just wants value out of it as opposed to closing the game with it, yeah. he can definitely do a dent into it. But now we see that the charge baby may be indicating that there's another one in Janak's uh, hand. Um, definitely have to be careful here in terms of uh, the uh, sequence of plays. So that risky play of having the same instinct in drop and didn't manage to survive in the drop for the whole turn. So, you know, kudos to kudos to him for making that that strong analysis of what the likelihood of sticking around was. Yep, and here we see that beautiful play of hey, I just want to draw two whenever I want, and Soul Striker is the deck to do it because now he's gonna get a refresh on that energy and be able to keep his plays going. Sitting on four energy, but only one blue yellow. And we did see two Sensor Beans go already. Mm -hmm. So we know there's only a finite amount of ways that he's going to be able to reutilize that blue-yellow. Um, so odds are we're only going to be seeing a one to two more rival plays uh, round out uh, the rest of uh, these couple of turns. Oh. Ooh, one of the newer cards from the set, Vegeta and Kaba. Yeah, definitely one of the... Um, more subdued cards, not as flashy as the Kefla. I mean, or we just do both, and here's the Kefla anyways. <laughs> <laughs> but definitely powerful, uh, does incredible value, especially when you uh, the ability to rival multiple cards with it. It can arrival for blue or yellow. I mean, it doesn't really matter what you have available. You can get it down on board. Uh, so fantastic value here. Um, probably indicating there's a Dimension Magic or Hatch in hand and saying, I don't care if I'm tapped out because I don't think you're killing me. Ooh. Yeah, very, very, very brave endeavor. Uh, also, yeah, Kefla could have the opportunity to block. We're probably not going to see that, though. Uh, Calamity Challenger has the opportunity to be a block. So even if hypothetically something happened to, ba to the baby Hatchiak that may be in Janik's hand, uh, there's still defensive options on top of the five life. Yeah, and that's just the beauty of being able to awaken Soul Striker early. Um, you have that nice bed to sit on, you know? And it's not like you're costing yourself cards. Usually decks that awaken early sometimes miss out on cards by doing so. But Soul Striker is one of those decks that accrues so much value. Because your leader draws two on Awaken, you're kind of counteracting that and being able to really play the advantage game out really well. And this is where the matchup, I think, really starts to turn the tide. I think we see a lot of early game advantage, which David's deck really leans more towards and weans off a little bit more as the game proceeds versus a deck that can really just outvalue you as we go into the later turns. Yeah, and while some blue-yellow decks are, are playing a slower game, and when we say turning the tide, the slower decks are playing the seven cost, <laughs> this guy's turning the tide on turn three, turn four. Yeah, putting a ton of pressure, forcing David to start using the cards out of his hand, um, and sitting pretty, you know? Uh, the beauty of D-Magic and anything like that means that on the defenses, he's probably coasting as far as the rest of the turns go. That average eight to nine hand by, by David, but there are definitely super combos in that hand. Yep. Uh, that Toa Sparking super combo, being like a, a pretty unusual uh, card. You don't see Sparking super combos often, but Mitch Shikibura is the deck to play them in. Yep, absolutely. You can just accrue so much value from the different one drops you can get, but now David down to one life, which is incredibly, incredibly precarious. But we're not going to go all in. We are just going to wait off on a turn. As you said, you're definitely posturing like he has a baby hatchback secret rare. You remember back in the day when that card was unplayable? When they said it was. It wait, was wait, bad? yeah, yeah, when it was bad and it was like. It was a third of what the other collectible SCRs were going for because players were like, oh, yeah, it doesn't win me the game. Which, you know, I guess if you're comparing to like the Celzinos yeah. and Awake, you know, uh, Apex of Powers at the time. But uh, And then you realize that it actually says uh, skip their turn, take another turn. Yeah. And they're like, oh, great, right, Super Shenron was, was eroded and basically banned. Yeah, yeah. so, you know, <laughs> that on a free-to-play, which doesn't require 20 battle cards in my drop, uh, you know, maybe it's pretty uh. good. I can tap out and then just restart my next turn. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. Panzeno is another secret rare that would that Jenna could also be playing that would really impact this turn. Yep, absolutely. So here's saying, you know, uh, we can if he decides to play Pan, then he's just deciding, you know what, your leader, I don't mind too much. I, more, I care more about the battle cards. And then having the ability of just being a better aggressor. It's a 40k just like uh, Hatch, but has the ability to swipe a card. Yeah. And most of the time, that would be fine. But against a, a triple attacking draw three, uh, you probably just want to stop all the attacks. Probably just call it a day and say, you know, I don't want to really worry about it. Oh. Yannick, learning a lesson as lessons learned get stolen by Fuji. Uh, however, that dual attack will be will be uh, negated and ignored. Yep, it serves more as just removal more so. It extends your board and it can be definitely obnoxious, but just it's a good cheap way to be able to start mitigating with what your opponent is doing. 
Or maybe he'll get to turn seven and evolve it into one hit destruction Vegeta. You know, hey, you know maybe that's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> God, how priceless would that be? He's out here playing 5D chess. Yeah. And we're, we're, we're so, yeah, barely playing checkers. <laughs> Janik reviewing his hand. So I think this is a place where David might be trying to play till what, turn five, six? Cause I don't think he's got the tools on board at the moment to be able to close out mm -hmm. uh, Gen X five life at the moment. Right. Which that's the play that the longer you can wait to resolve that hatchback, the, the better you're gonna be, right? Cause if he resolves it on this turn four, he's effectively getting five free energy for mm -hmm. it. If he waste one more turn, it's effectively five free energy. Yeah. At the same time, also, if he can wait and get David to tap out all his energy and overextend, knowing there's almost no way he loses the game, mm -hmm. that's some optimal gameplay. Yeah, absolutely. And it's just, it's it's a very tough spot to be in because not only do you need to mitigate your... There it is. <laughs> it's like we are saying. And uh, Janak basically saying here, you know, you know what? This uh, this uh, minus five ability of my uh, unison, no, this, this, this is going to go off. This, this is what I need. We already know he plays Golden Avenger. We, we got the years coming in double strike. There's a lot to be afraid of going into this. Yeah, game. absolutely. And, that, and that's that's what was made it such a tough spot for David to be in here because he had to not only start applying pressure so that he can actually close out the game at some point, but mitigate the unison because, you know, Baby's going to come through and prevent any negates that he might have. And then uh, who knows where uh, Janna can take his uh, aggression yeah. from there. His hand's a little, little thin, though. I, I, if I'm saying four cards. Yep. And he may have a Saiyan Instinct. I'm not 100% sure. Yeah definitely helps and then with the leader swing so now we're looking at a healthy seven card hand mm -hmm. post leader swing of course i would presume that he ultimates yeah. the uh yeah. the baby here mm -hmm. that toa that toa does not have blocker that's the that's the three drops so we start with the leader swing interesting decision you know there's a word where the argument is swing with the baby and then minus five yep um my anticipation is he's valuing for exactly this interaction. If he has the the god sealing, that could be bueno. Well, you do want to be careful about launching the god seal here because it does lock you out of the A play. Mm -hmm. So that's a great observation. Yeah. Ooh, pain two. Desperate measures. Please hit me with the desperate measures. I've never won it so bad in my life. Is he just gonna tap the five? Is he just gonna say nope? This is the uh, four. Oh. Oh, look at that pretty promo. Where did he get that? Oh, look at the guy just saying, you know what? No, and that's the beauty of this card. It is still yeah. so incredibly yeah. good. Like, it is such a good card. Mm -hmm. um, but still live, right? So it, the, the attack is still negated. Correct. And now he doesn't have five. So he does, if he wants to start getting through something, he knows that that Kai is going to come down at some point. So Zamasu Luminary here, bouncing a four drop back to hand. It has been eroded. It no longer hits unisons, um, but it's still an incredibly powerful card. Um, it's a chomp of the trickster that prevents cards from coming to play, and it draws a card. So uh, at any point in time, it's still an incredibly good card, even after the errata. So how, how did I'm trying to... Oh, so, so okay, he, so he discarded yeah, to get for the opportunity attack. for dual attack. Yeah, so here... Well, we see that petrification. Is this the timing for it? Yeah, because... Yeah, okay. Ooh. So now we see the God Seal. So here we're saying, no, you are... N That's it. That's all the counter plays that uh, Jenna can do now. Yeah. We're going to see petrification. Try to prevent the hatch from attacking. Uh, yeah. Wow. What an exciting... Yeah, definitely a different turn of how I thought mm -hmm. that this turn was going to play out. But even then, like, it, it still feels like Janak is in yeah. an okay position. Yeah. yeah. Fuji's definitely up on cards in hand, though. This yeah, absolutely. Anyone's game. So Hatch is, is, is just sitting on quality combo power at this point. We got the 15k, baby. That threatens game. So, it sure does. So, like, this is an opportunity in Wild Janak doesn't have a lot of cards in hand. It may be an opportunity to force a few cards out of yeah. David's before he goes into his counter aggro. He does have two 10k combos on the board that he could he could combo them off of his field yeah. if, if, if he was hungry. We'll see at least a little bit of that. And maybe an arrival Vegeta. Oh, no. Just... Okay. Just the raw 25. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That's not too bad. I got spooked for a second. I thought he was grabbing his life, but that was just his hand that was set off inside.
overwhelm still being a possibility yep. for uh, Gen X. We're gonna see another tap out. Hey, wow. So here probably just saying my dimension magic is gonna get me my blue yellow again and then wow. we'll close from there. So is there an extension here? Is there an overrealm? There is an there overrealm. Is an overrealm. What, what is it? Ooh, Ooh, secret identity. Very nice to be able to clean out the board and say, yeah, your aggression's gonna come, but I'm gonna reset that. And you're gonna have to put a little bit of work into reset resetting your board. So now we know it's an unconditional combo out here. I, I, I anticipated at least. I have to imagine. I mean, 25k already is so large. Mm -hmm. um, and every card you get out of David's hand just makes his aggression even harder for the next turn. Granted, still has the ability to triple attack his leader and draw three additional cards. Correct. I'm gonna ask himself how high is he gonna go? All right, we're at least 25. Janik's reflecting upon life. All right, we're just gonna leave it at 25, force a super combo out of David's hand and another 5k. Interesting. Comboing away that Kai, if, if I'm David, or if, I, if I'm Janix shoes, seeing that Kai getting comboed away tells me that David is posturing to try to win this next turn, which makes sense because I don't think we're going to see Soul Striker tapped out again. Yeah, I don't think so either. I think this is probably the pr most pristine uh, opportunity he has to be able to push on some aggression. Um, and David recognizing it's probably this uh, here, or we're probably not going to see this chance again. So, yeah. Using uh, this opportunity, uh, getting all seven balls away, and yep, saying I want to see three additional cards, and it's either this turn or it's not gonna happen. Yeah, Fu Coercion inc Incarnate would be a fascinating card to hit here. He'd have to pick between one of the Kefala and the Hatchy Act and I, but he couldn't mm -hmm. hit both. True. Uh, I'm gonna guess this is a counter negate. Yeah, this is a reinforcements. Yep. Shield Army Reinforcements, playing a token, and that beautiful anime waifu token is serving as a block of the turn. Yep. Now we'll just take that. <laughs> I'm hungry. Do you remember if the blue token has combo power? And oh. <laughs> David says, uh, I, I prefer this one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it does not have combo power. Okay. On, on the uh, on the opposite side, then it has ten thousand attack power, which is a you know a, a healthy, plentiful amount that could go for game. Yeah, if if it just stands, hey, maybe a ten k attacker with a you know a couple of super yeah. combos could get there. And the weirder things have happened. <laughs> that they have. Actually, well, the making a bird can only sell tokens or things that are cost four or less, right? That is correct. It's also once per turn. Um, and I don't know if he can use the activate main to lose all his balls and gain triple attack, as well as actually swipe a card using his ability. Hmm. But, Interesting uh, dynamic. Yeah, of course. But, you know, stream does there, and uh, I'm sure they're working it out amongst themselves. Mm -hmm. mm. Vegeta Super Cambo. Anniversary Alternate Arts. Very pretty. Yeah, absolutely love everything they do with the anniversary box. Um, yeah. Always providing a phenomenal art type. You know, uh, Ages of Direction were great. Uh, I'm a big fan of SS4 Bardock, and uh, the reprints are always very much welcome. And the only cards that might be prettier is this Mystic Booster. This absolutely. Mystic Booster Those alternate arts are phenomenal. Very, very nice cards. Oh, Zeno is an untap. That is yep. one way to get your energy back. And that ape. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was anticipating Dimension Magic, but then I'm like, oh, it's drop 17. Yeah. Huh. All right, so turning the tide, just sitting there. I mean, now that we know Gen X on Zenos, it's like, oh, I can get that later. Yeah. For now, we'll, we'll see. What an interesting choice, though, because the, the theory I imagine is you go edge of space and have taps and energy, saying instincts, I'm trying to get that in the drop so I can draw two next turn. Here's my blue yellow. Hello, Kefla. Hello, Vegeta and Kaba. Yeah. Wow. Very good setup. The, the dentist has thought all of this through. Absolutely. And with when, surgical precision. As one would of his profession. And he himself, oh, what makes my deck unique? You made it myself. I gave it a heart. And now it's alive. I can activate the heart of my cards. And that he is definitely showcasing here in this round. Beautiful. We see David Fuji reflecting a little bit upon the options that he has. And that 8, 9, 10 card hand, uh, he's going to have a few of them. Yeah, searching for some more options, see if that anything in the top of his deck can help him out of this situation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Super combo. <laughs> you know, if these cards aren't helping me, I have something that yeah, draws, yeah. maybe will. Exactly, I'll find something. The uh, top of my deck will help me, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
you have to be scared about the long game anytime you see that turning the tide in energy you have to be asking yourself so if i go to seven what's going to happen it's effectively a clock mm -hmm. it's uh you know here gen x saying threatening him with saying hey this is something that's going to come down at some point mm -hmm. and you need to be ready for it um and if my board stays the way it is uh that's calling for game on the flip side, it is a card that most people are playing between one and two copies of, right? So you see that one copy in your energy and you have to ask yourself, does he have the second copy or do I not have to fear about it anymore? Yeah, and it's a mind game you play, right? It's it's those little minute things that uh, when we really get into trenches competitive play, you're trying to mind game your opponent. And that's as much of an uh, important aspect as uh, actually just playing out your cards. Amen to that. So we're sorting some drop areas, we're reflecting on hand sizes five cards we know why that is important dimension magic yep absolutely it gives Janak the opportunity to tap out and still have defense when it comes around to his turn again you see toa toa is a 15k attacker that'll generate another card and that's what this deck does so well i mean able to just generate a bunch of like aggression that chains into more aggression yeah. everything replaces itself mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we call that free real estate absolutely The beauty of this Toa that uh, David just picked up being that it's unconditional removal, just choose anything on the board and get rid of it. Mm -hmm. um, however, at the cost of tapping out, I don't know if uh, David can afford to do so. The double sense of being played once again, setting Soul Striker at a healthy 25k now. these combatants such a wild episode just like last game back and forth alternating on the back foot this this salsa of of gameplay is fascinating to me <laughs> absolutely i think mickey copper definitely lends itself to uh living on the edge i think if, mm -hmm. if, if, if you're looking for gameplay that really strides the line i think this is definitely one of those decks as we saw from the last game showcase and this one um these games are going to have some interesting backs and forths for sure for sure. And, and the longer too, right? Because Dragon Ball Super Card Game uh, had a reputation for a long time of games are ending turn three, turn four, maybe just maybe turn five if you're trying really hard for that. Is that what we're seeing today in this format? No, uh, not at all. I think it, it can, depending on the right matchups, but here we're definitely seeing huge interactive play with a lot of different options. Players being able to do many things, not only defensively, but offensively to really start to extend these games. And you know, the better you are at knowing your matchups, uh, the more so the reality is that these these games are going to push for these later turns. And if you're a newer player, this is a great time to get into the game as well. With these longer turns are leading to more opportunities, more decision making, and those decisions are less punishing because you have so many decisions over the course of a long game. Yep, absolutely. Uh, we are definitely in a place where uh, you can rest a little bit on your laurels. And if you make a mistake, that's okay because the game will show you, provide you opportunity to be able to make the comeback. Mm -hmm. So as we reflect upon this, what looks like a 30K, uh, power after combo. Yep, uh, fighting against fate here, making his notable appearance once again. And we see a second swing. Uh, Janok deciding if what's more important, three life or two, while he is sitting on a small two card hand. And I think that's what David's trying to do right now, just force as many cards out of Janak's hand as possible. Uh, to say, yeah, it's gonna be your turn, but you know, I will win the card advantage game, and we'll see if uh, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll see if you're able to make something happen. Could you digging deep for an answer here? No Chompa in hand, uh, which is probably what he was trying to fake out. You know, maybe for Janak to feel uncomfortable at two life and go from there. But at minimum, we do know that Janak has a 10k combo on board, mm -hmm. so uh, that Goku is a 35k. Ooh, we see the 10,000 token. And, and secretly, quietly in Janok's head, he's thinking, does David play Furthering Destruction Chompa? That's on the top of any player's mind anytime they're sitting at two life and definitely looks like David's cheating here to make it seem that way. <laughs> um, but you know what? David may be also understanding that this turn is the turn he's gonna get. Mm -hmm. So swing with the token, then maybe swing with the Toa and hope that the combo power can get there. Wow. I think I think he's gambling right, here. Yeah. Right now, the only attack left is this is this four thousand Toa. Yep. At the moment, Overrealm's gone, so we know that that extension's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, he can't play uh, any of the one cost sauces uh, or shrooms because uh, he no longer has balls. Yeah. And that's a requirement for their play. So uh, definitely here, just trying to play the advantage game. Mm -hmm. 
And from Janak, one of the things I'm asking myself is do I combo away my my baby Hatchiac if I need to? Mm -hmm. How important is two life? Well, apparently oh. too much for David to be able to close out this game and Janak tapes game one, wow. pushing it to a round game two. Well, if I'm Janak, I'm I'm so excited. Such such a hard fought battle. You know, David said, you know, I, I'm on the back foot. The only way I win is I swing with my first attacker. I get it down to one life. I swing with my 4K Toa. Is that enough to get me there? Mm -hmm. And Yunok saw that was the last option. Yep, absolutely. And I think it really just goes to showcase, like, um, when you look at some of the more historical players like David Fujimara, um, big, in, uh, big focus on the advantage game. Um, I think combo power is something that uh, modern gameplay is a little bit uh, less focused on, mm -hmm. but I think is highly important when we talk about being able to sit at these top tables. Um, mitigating your hand advantage versus my advantage, knowing when to combo, uh, knowing what numbers make sense versus what your opponent can have in hand. Mm -hmm. And I think that was really showcased here with David saying, you know what, there might actually be an out here. And given that, you know, if uh, Janai didn't have two beans, that very much could have been enough to get there. Yeah, he did play all four Sunsu beans that game, didn't he? That he did. He saw all four. He doubled up once, and he doubled up twice. Yeah. I do remember, like, you're like, I don't think we're gonna see too many because he saw two, <laughs> and he's like, nope, I, I resolved three sane instincts. I'm gonna see them all. Oh, uh, when you're good, you're good. <laughs> I'm real close with Corin. He he, he has an in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the guy keeps some yeah. extra stash in the back. Yeah, put some braces. Get hooked with some braces back in the day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, sideboard options here. What are we looking for from these two decks? Yeah. So if I'm Mechie after that game, I have to, I have to feel like I needed to close the game faster. Mm -hmm. uh, Soul Striker can snowball in a way where you know, in, in a three-turn game, you know, Soul Striker only attacked once. You only got two additional energy compared to what the opponent had. Mm -hmm. In a six-turn game, you're seeing twelve or you're saying like. Uh, like six more energy yeah. and that's almost an, an entire other turn mm -hmm. uh, in comparison uh so you know at these high levels you always have to ask yourself who's the beatdown who is the aggressive player is my onus to be able to put the opponent in a place where they can't resolve their most powerful cards by closing the game quickly or are my strongest cards better than their stronger cards and i'm trying to play the long game mm -hmm. uh, what we saw there is both played relatively passively and we saw Soul Strike will be able to eat that out. Yep, I, th I think that's uh, definitely, you hit the nail there, where it's definitely, am I the aggressor or am I the control player? You know, what what is my deck trying to do this game to certify the win? And I think you're absolutely right. I think your Mechie Copper needs to start closing down the game a little bit earlier and has a, a potential to do so. You know, turn three, turn two, turn three aggro is something the deck can do incredibly well. And it's definitely something that David's gonna have to utilize here to be able to put Janak in an uncomfortable position. Not one where he can comfortably play his three cost unison, awaken, sell five life. Um, I think putting him in a position where at any point past turn three, Janak needs to be careful about what he's playing because it could uh, provide David the opportunity to be uh, to swing for lethal is where David wants it. Yeah, and Janak, you know, one of the interesting things about this blue yellow deck, uh, because of the pattern of having to have two, uh, two blue to be able to awaken, you almost always have to charge a blue yellow mm -hmm. turn one. And that is a window of vulnerability as a control as, as a as for an aggro deck you can take advantage of that yeah absolutely you just know that okay my turn two which can be one of my more explosive turns turn two turn three is definitely what the deck's able to do mm -hmm. um is one where i'm going to be able to push and the odds are he's not gonna be able to do much you know he's not gonna have enough cards in draw for dimension magic he's not gonna have bean live mm -hmm. um which bean is a phenomenal card in this matchup because the lost wings are 15 k's yeah. being able to take that away from him is definitely going to be a big changer in terms of uh setting the tone of where three and onwards are going to be. The other really important dynamic of this game too, it looks like it took about 30, 35 minutes for that game one. That means that if David chose to play a more passive route, he may not be able to finish a game three. So that's even more onus that he needs to be the aggressor here. Yep, absolutely. Uh, pace of game is going to be huge here just to make sure uh, that a game three is seen as far as the new game rules go. Uh, if we do hit time in a game two, winner of game one takes down the entire match. So David is does have the onus here to try and uh, close the game out. David choosing to charge Ghost Warrior is most certainly one of the cards in his side deck. It's a very interesting card. It allows uh, the player, when the opponent uses a battle card or an extra guard, uh, for example, Sensu Bean, uh, to switch an energy to active mode. Um, they have to warp five cards from their drop or they don't have the permission to utilize that. Mm -hmm. 
So it'll be very interesting to see that. There, there's also the Gohan Zeno uh, that can also punish opponents for uh, manipulating their energy in ways. Uh, it'll be ex very exciting to see if David charged the Ghost Warriors, maybe because he has the Gohan, or if he just felt like he needed it to be able to awaken on turn. Yeah, maybe. Uh, indicating maybe that his hand is aggressive enough that he's not going to have to worry about going for those late game options. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, here we are, like we said, Genak having to commit to that blue yellow turn one because there's no real opportunity later in the game to be able to do so. And uh, here we're probably going to see David do the most of his work. Yeah. Going back into his life, though, indicating, nope, I guess he just wanted a refresher on what was in there. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, uh, a lot of people, they, well, keep in mind that he did go first, so this was the first time true, he got to evaluate true, his true, life. True, true, true. Uh, but David being, taking the, the, the most ethical high ground, uh, just quickly looking, are there bulge? Yes, no, put the life back. There are some people that look a little bit slower, uh, but that's not the that's not who we have sitting yep, here. Absolutely. Do you always take the balls from life? Or do you sometimes gamble that your opponent's gonna hit so, you so a bit? It, so it depends on, on, on a few ways, right? Because if they, if they, so if they do pick up that life, you're eventually gonna have to pick that up anyway. So that's an argument. Uh, the other argument is in a case like this deck, if he hits you with critical, and puts the ball into drop, especially if it's not the Emperor Strikes Back, it's the Yearn for the Dark Dragon Balls, that feels so much better for you. Right. So I would say in general, it's it's often a little bit better to wait, but it, it's very, very dependent on the matchup, the likelihood of them taking life. Um, if you're playing against a control deck that you know is not gonna hit you, you take it from the life now because you want to increase the likelihood of seeing your ball sooner rather than later. Right. That's, that is the, the pro and con that you're trying to play. Mm -hmm. Especially here, I think, uh, depending on the turn that David will want to awaken because the other uh, cards that dump the balls into the drop, I'll do it from deck. So definitely depends. It looks like here he's lining up for maybe turn three awaken, um, opting to use the Mickey Cabra to be able to play two cards from his deck. Yeah, generally this deck most certainly has the capacity to awaken on turn two. That is the exception, and, or I wouldn't say it's the exception of the rule, uh, but but turn three is is the, the more likely of the two. Right, it's a sweet spot where he's gonna be able to do the most with his energy. Precisely. So we do see that uh, getting those doubles. Uh, we see that gravy that has the opportunity to go up to 30k very bulky very hard to remove especially in a deck like blue yellow that doesn't have a whole bunch of wide removal and if this was a green deck it'd be a different conversation uh, but we also see this vanilla shroom um coming in and then exposing the opportunity for some of these five drops uh from the original shroom and salsa deck uh to be able to get in there and do some damage yep that 20k salsa being really obnoxious in terms of being able to apply more pressure uh, usually you can line it up in a way that your opponent won't be able to make the choice and then you just get your free attacker on there additionally on top of them which is always very nice and then you're turning your board horizontally and hoping you get there mm -hmm. all right charge swing and pass for janak sitting at five life most likely going to go for a uh awaken from life here um just based on the amount of pressure that david yeah. is pressing Rogue prospect not the first card you would have imagined that he charges Ooh. The technology. Whoa. Pocket screw in. <laughs> yeah, so the Ocean is here serving as an alternative topo where you get to pay two, and if she hits board, you not only do you negate the attack, but now every time your opponent attacks, they have to send cards from the top of their deck, four of them, into draw for every swing. So unlike topo where it's costing you cards in your hand, it's costing you cards from your deck. And in a game where it could go long, you know, one or two swings equates to four or eight cards, you might just be taking out you know, two to three turns off your available clock. And for a deck like Mickey Cabra, which can draw as much as it does, that is a very real possibility. You know, when Brian was here talking to us earlier, we asked him what he was afraid of. He said the mainstream answer was Cell Surge. Uh, the risky, the, the less, more low key concern, nil. Mm -hmm. So this card being being played and in, in, having the capacity to be played in virtually any deck is, is intimidating. Uh, and again, with David drawing as much as he does, that is why players are playing more than 50 cards. This deck, this card, this Oceanus, is almost single-handedly that reason why. Oh, absolutely. Just because, like it or not, you need to be able to press sometimes past the Oceanus. And this is what we're seeing David see, saying here, like, my early turn aggressions are too important. And, uh... You know, maybe he gets lucky and he hits a couple of balls off of it as well. Correct. That is that is the uh, the playoff here, and especially in a deck that could be playing overwhelm like David's deck does. Uh, sometimes putting those cards in the drop uh, end up being value for the opponent and not punishment. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And here comes that salsa bounce play that you were predicting, um, and now forcing Janak in an awkward position. So salsa the demon god being able to uh, potentially play a free battle card if David can get rid of Janak's uh, drop in time, which it looks like those cards are both removed from the game. They are warped. They're warped. 
So that is going to bring some value. We see that 15k gravy. He's more than likely going to go up to 30k here. As it does so well. Um, but we'll we'll see now. So like he got his couple of swings in. So now this is where we're really going to see how much is David going to commit to this turn three aggro. And I think this is very much answering that question here. Uh, just saying we are going to send it here. There's the double strike guy. Now if I'm Janak, you know, no matter what the outcome of this game, whether I'm winning or losing, I need to take time at the end of this game. Look at that drop area, take some mental notes. What are the one ofs? What are the two ofs? Uh, so I'm best equipped for this game three, or if I play him in top cut tomorrow. Absolutely, I think information is key and the more that you can grab early on, then all the better you are prepared for anything. Uh, you know, like how many Kai's is he really running, right? And you can take note of that and be prepared for uh, the later halves of the game. And like you said, the later parts of the tournament, if I see you again. Yep. So we are beginning to see, we may very well be seeing some kind of a rival based play. Uh, now that we are at below five life, four life actually, uh, you know, we do get the opportunity to untap that energy. We see the Saiyan instincts. And do we see the Kaba Vegeta? That we do? We do. Wow. Very nice. Commentator's blessing. I do declare. <laughs> I do declare. Yeah, so removal, which is very nice here, gonna definitely help on the defense. Um, and, you know, Janak might start to just need filling up his drop, right? Um, uh, Dimension Magic is live at five, so there is also that double uh, usage of the fact that the closer he is to five, the more he can extend his defense, um, and the more he might be able to protect himself from what... I mean, at this point, I think it's very clear that uh, David's uh, committed to saying, no, this is this is probably the turn I'm going to push through, um, yeah. just with how many cards he's milled off of the Oceanus. What an interesting situation. David trying to find a way to extend enough to get that same instincts out of the drop. And we're going to see it through a salsa. Ability to go through deck, find a couple more balls, be able to dump him in there. We, we know what question uh, David's asking. Do you have the God Ceiling? And we should know the answer is no, because he doesn't have the Unison yet. Mm -hmm. And here, Jen actually have the ability to cycle a card out of his hand. So bye bye, Kai, uh, just to be able to cycle something else. But also getting rid of stuff out of his drop, right? And this is what this is going to be really good at. These salsas, these shrooms um, are going to be really good at keeping Janak off of sparking. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Ooh, that deck is getting tiny. That is very, very thin here. And I think we have to be at, uh, I'm going to venture to guess around 10. I imagine he has three more swings and that's it. And this is just him committing to saying, you know, at any point he could stop. And technically, if he doesn't swing with his leader, and like he doesn't swing with like the sauce that draws him a card, he might have a couple more turns if he plays it very carefully and doesn't draw any more cards. Um, so this could just be him weighing the pros and cons and just saying like, no, you know, I think the more I do right now, even if I take it a bit slower going into my turn four, turn five, it'll be enough to get there. That final answer to answer the question, how many cards were left in David's deck? I believe I counted nine. So anything else this turn will lower down his clock by eight. eight. So two more, well, one more swing actually. <laughs> oh, he needed to do that. So he couldn't have awakened until he resolved the balls. So they're working to get that figured out. Can't put a card back into his deck. That puts him back to about eight, eight or nine, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, I believe. And this is where Oceanus is going to shine, right? Because maybe, because at the beginning of the, of the turn, you know, it, it didn't read as much. It, it really wasn't, it didn't really, it topped one attack for two energy. That's kind of whatever. But now it says, if you resolve any more Oceanus, you win the game. Pretty much, yeah. Uh, like, like, you're, turn's down to every, every Oceanus past this point is basically a hatch. Correct. Um, so if Janak makes it to his next turn and he finds an Oceanus, mm -hmm. then he's coasting. Because at that point, David will not have the ability to keep attacking. Kingdom Lost is going to drop down. We're going to see a card uh, get ripped out of that hand. Some very powerful options. Ooh, could be look, a look hatch. Clean that be... one. <laughs> Super combo pretty good. That's probably something that Janak was banking on, being able to get his energy uh, back for the defensive plays. And we know he's not on the full play set. He does have some Vegeta on the deck. Now the question is, is he on a 3-1 split or 2-2 split? But uh... all right, that's it. David says that's enough. Now, what can you do with the spot I put you in? 
one of the interesting things that Soul Striker has the, the luxury of now against this aggro deck is you can commit to the unison. You don't have to. Yep. You're already awakened. You you know, you can get that Saiyan Instincts and drop. You can do whatever you want. But he says, nah, I'm sticking to my game plan. I'm, I'm feeling all right, and I want to see some cards. See some cards. I mean, at the end of the day, you're going to get that two energy refresh. Anyhow, from the leader swing, so you're feeling good about it one way or another. So you really have to be asking yourself, am I playing the long game now? With those nine cards, do, do I just, you know, that puts him on, what, a four-turn clock? Yeah, ish, give or take. Um, and like we said, any Oceanus from here on out is basically a hatch. Yeah. So uh, he's definitely in a position now where it's like, well, now I could worry about your leader, but how about I deal with your board, and then I just mitigate my defenses to make sure you can't get there. Right. He, he, he's just pulling at you at, at both angles, burning mm -hmm. the candle on both ends. And the the one grace that I always say David will have is that every turn he does have the ability to put a card back into his deck, yep. and he does it do, that does extend it a little bit. We did see a very simple turn. David's back to play. David is has that book in his hand, the book of how to return to the throne, <laughs> and it starts with King Lost. Yeah, just a clean 19k double strike coming at what I have to presume is the leader at this point I don't think yeah there it is so unless he's got a counterplay here Oceanus is probably just saying I think this might just be the turn yeah if I'm if I'm David I'm, I'm begging to have a super Kamehameha and, and that seems to not be the case here it's just not so we're getting rid of the blocker though because that's that's the beauty of Oceanus you're at least forcing your opponent to two swings and just because it's a blocker You know, this just inspired me. I, now I, I really want to play like a. I want to find a way to bounce that Oceanus back. And mm -hmm. if I was Janak, I'm trying to find a way to do that. Yeah, I, I think there are a couple. I think the Xeno deck, the Xeno Shadow Dragon deck, might be able to. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not too difficult. I think a five, a five drop card that's black, it, it can't be too impossible to bounce. I'm sure. I'm sure there's a number of ways. And that's just what you're saying. Um, Oceanus here represents basically a hatch every turn now because yeah. how much David had to commit into his turn three. So Janak definitely, definitely down on cards here. Uh, you do have to discard cards. Uh, Jada Kingdom lost. You know that that's keeping his hand a little more manageable. Yep, you're forced to swing into it. If you're not, you do get get to lose the one. Yeah. Um, but there is a limit to how much Janak can play. I'm not gonna play Dragon Ball. Yeah. <laughs> so at some point, David Knight might just be scoping out here to see if he can get another opening and go from there. Yeah. Ironically, that seven markers probably feeling like 61 markers. <laughs> you know how hard it is. Oh, yeah. I think at this point we're basically saying, yeah, that's not gonna, that's not gonna change much here. Uh, setting up for the free ape, which is always nice. Now he's threatening the King Vegeta, but now he's gonna get the two-card refresh to extend his defenses. If he draws into another Oceanus, he knows David doesn't have the Kamehameha, so unless he's top decking it, well then, uh, potentially buy himself another turn. Yeah, but if I'm just not, I'm really trying to find a way to clear the board. Once I clear the board, I feel great about this game. Yeah, at, at that point, I think you're just coasting. Ooh, and we see the skills. Wow. Skill suppressed. Yep. Pay the one to bounce two cards back to the bottom of the deck. An interesting tech card. You know, we see some people are really hot on it. Some players not as much. Um, I think it's some that uh, some players really love it, or some players can uh, can do without it. Indeed. Skill sharpened. I apologize. Uh, here's the arrival. Is that what we're setting up for another Vegeta and Kaba? There we are. The dream would be to have uh, have blue red, be able to play a cooler or freeze a 100% overdrive right now. Oh yeah. How good would that be? That would be so sweet to be able to deal with this board incredibly well. And then you build them out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're going we're going to the lab tonight, man. Uh -huh. Yeah, one more day. We, we could have won, won yeah, the tournament. Of course, we could have just brought it down. But you know, we have to give these players a shot somehow. <laughs> somehow. <laughs> In fact, the matter, even if we did, we have amazing players on the screen oh, here that absolutely. would be playing us out of the weather. Calamity Challenger giving a little bit of defense. We got that second attack on Lessons Learned. <laughs> So now, Janak, I think, recognizing that he can actually attack David in two angles here. 
One, they came, or with this pressure, uh, forced him into a life situation. And now it's uncomfortable. Both players being in a pretty precarious position here. Um, David having to maybe face more Oceanus, which could really, you know, cause the trouble. Uh, here, uh, Janak only having so far that he can extend his defenses until he runs out. Yeah. And unfortunately, one of the downsides here is this Mexica Burra deck really relies on high cost and battle cards, which makes his aggression vulnerable to heroic prospect trunks. Though on the flip side, trunks will make me put two cards on the bottom of my deck. <laughs> Maybe uh, David needs it right that's now. That's pretty good. Hey, that's some, uh, that's some anti Oceanus gas right there. <laughs> Again, burning the candle on both sides, and, and David is now being forced to find the answer. Will he? Let's find out. Yeah, and we are closing in on time tightly here, so uh, fighting it out till the very end, what we're going to see here, and uh, the, the, the last defining turns here are definitely going to decide what the final results of this entire match is going to be. So we saw the block on Calamity Challenger. Two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five. Most likely here. I think, looking I think for we're another. in eight now. Yeah. Super combo. All right, saying I need gas, I need to be able to punch in, and when I get there, I need to be able to do damage. Yeah. You know, I liked your first one so much. I'll take your second one. Another one. Again, those 19Ks missing out on the dual attack, unfortunately. Absolutely sitting there as vanilla cards, but nevertheless, 19K is a pretty sweet spot for a four drop. Mm. We see Sensu Beam, that's gonna give some defense. Yeah, it's a good card. Now forcing David to commit cards on all these swings now. Do see the Bardock in hand, so an Overrealm is nigh. He does still have the ability uh, to swing in with his board. But Both players starting to use their super combos at this point in the game. Mm -hmm. How do I find an answer? That's Drop. effectively what they're doing, yeah. Yeah. Uh, David here is trying to say, all right, what gas can I find? And uh, Gen X is saying, I got a couple of dead cards in hand. Let's get those rid of those and uh, see what uh, what we can do to change them. And with seven cards in my deck, I know what those cards are. So the overall here locking David out of his uh, leader's ultimate now. Yeah. So uh, very much committing to the play here. God seal. Oh, oh that is a deadly god seal. Oh. So well timed. Yeah. Both of these players are showing mastery with these decks. Mm, great patience. Um, great understanding of the matchup. Um, and like it just goes to show, right? With how much pressure David pressed in his turn three, regardless, we're still in these long game terms of uh, uh, situations where it's like, imagine if David had actually opted to not go for the aggression on his turn three, he would be even further away from potential victory than he is here. Yeah. They're just analyzing at every moment. How do I, where's the pain point? Where, where's the pressure point? Where do I need to let off on the gas? Where do I need to let them walk into my trap? Mm -hmm. Zamasu super combo here, locking down not only the current attack by comboing out of it, but locking down the leader, preventing a swing, preventing a draw, and letting David have as little access to gas as possible. Dark Mask King, the Luge of Darkness. Him really trying to sit on that. Uh, that's five cost. Uh, when this card attacks, you may send one card from your opponent's life to the warp for every 10 cards in their warp. Uh, so it's trying to serve as that burn damage if he can get, you know, if he can get there. Yeah, three life is the magic number. One for burn and double strike uh, could definitely get there. Whoa, hard casting the salsa. <laughs> wow. And salsa makes more sense than deluge. Question is, where's your wish wish grant when you need it? Yeah. yeah. Oh, this has been so incredibly sweet. All right, we're in. Oh, paying two. Not, not taking advantage of the free. Yeah, very nice. I think recognizing double strike range is always precarious. Anytime you're at two life, you're always worried. There's always some way that some player is going to be able to sneak in two damage. So here, dictating, nope, you know what? We're just going to coast at our three.
both players doing math here. Yep. That that's seven card floor left. Yep. Sparking now being gone, so the super combo will not draw a card. Mm -hmm. We are approaching where time is going to be a relevant factor, and the difference between having three life and two life is going to mean the world. Absolutely, you're dictating exactly where this pendulum is going to swing. One, two, three, four, five. I believe I saw all six for that secret identity to be online. Mm -hmm. Be able to clear out the board, and uh, Danak sitting in a decently strong position. At any point in time, he can make his leader a double striker. Um, and apply a ton of pressure. And I think Jenna, David here just calling it. Yeah. Saying play it out. Let's play it out. Let's see. All right. Here's oh, the Kepler. Wow. All right. They're going to play it out. Huh. Pay the two, get the draw, have the combo power, and then pitch, draw two, and then swing for game. Seems good. All wow. right. And Janak is your winner versus David Fuji Amara Blue Yellow Soul Striker, taking it up against Meki Cabra to go into the next round undefeated. Assumably the, the second most popular deck, and we just learned why that is. Yeah, the ability to have so many different options, both aggressively and defensively, when your opponent is playing it out, um, definitely showcased its when your opponent is playing it out, um, definitely showcased itself here. And I think that's what we were saying. When you give player the abilities to have options and decide how to best utilize their cards, that's where we're going to see the skill of this gameplay really shine. Yep, we're gonna find the goods, we're gonna find the greats, and we're gonna find the national champions. Mm -hmm. And that is why we are here. Absolutely. And I think a lot of defining moments in that game, um, the Oceanus play versus uh, David, uh, forcing him into a situation where he's like, I don't know if, and you know, it, it may seem like a precarious decision to have attacked as much as he did, but I mean, just look at where the game was on turn five when he did put that much pressure. Imagine if he didn't, then he would be even further away from the win condition. Right. And I love is that he had match awareness. He didn't just have game awareness. He said, I knew I need to find a way to get a lead in game two try to win that game two as quickly as possible and then we'll see how game three plays out in terms of the, the time rules he was playing to his outs and that is one of the key indicators of a top tier player yep absolutely it's kind of deciding you know you can't play to not lose you, you have to play to win you got to play to win i love it and that and that includes you know like you said match awareness it's not just about this game but this is a one out of three and depending on where we are on time you know we might be fighting for a place where I'm not only worried about this game, I'm worried about my tournament. And my tournament can definitely be focused around what I'm doing right now, because based on my score now, I might have a chance to face this deck again later on in the tournament, and now I'll show them how I'm going to win this. And these are all these are all lessons learned. Like, if, if I'm Janok, after that game, I'm saying, you know, if I get stuck playing against the Brian Samuel in, in top cut in round eight, I now know what I'm getting myself into. Mm -hmm. I know where the pain points are. I know where I have opportunities to take advantage. You know, maybe he's telling himself, you know, that ocean Janice was a great call. Maybe he was telling himself, maybe that's not the route I need to go. Maybe holding on to that heroic prospect would have been better, but he's learning to make formulations and that level of adaptation is another key factor of a national champion. Yes, absolutely. And the same can be said for David. It is not done for David, guys. X1 is absolutely a wonderful record to be able to make it into top cut. So phenomenal player like he is, there's no doubt in my mind that he will definitely make all the other players in this tournament sweat as they all fight for their spot in a top position to make it to day two of the tournament. Amen. So we're, we're gonna see if we can get him get him on the mic for not. We are very close to the end of the round. Uh, we need to make sure our competitors have enough time to sit, recompose themselves, and then come back in uh, for their next round, uh, level-headed. Uh, but again, um, for those of you wondering what the what the format's looking like right now, uh, three of our most popular decks: Kid Icarus, Soul Striker, Gogeta Zeno. I would say Cell Surge is underrepresented yeah. compared to the public anticipation. And the one deck that everybody is on that nobody anticipated. Yellow Sin. Uh, Yellow a deck, Sin. A, a deck that I think everyone respects, but no one really talks about. Mm -hmm. And it, maybe this is why, you know, uh, the closer we get to Nationals, everyone wants to keep their tech to themselves. And clearly a good chunk of the tournament here decided that, you know, I think it's the deck for one. And I understand it, right? It's a deck that can both go slow, it can go fast. Um, and it keeps your opponent guessing as to which route you're going to go up against. Yeah. And there's a ton, ton of decks that, that, you know, had some attention here. Six people on Cooler, 
Never anticipated that. <laughs> um, six people on Red Jiren is fantastic. Uh, King Cold, Jingo <laughs> Tanks. Uh, nine people on Golden Frieza. Shout out to Cross World King Cross World CCG, yeah. They brought the sauce. <laughs> we saw that last round. I and you might see it tomorrow. I'd like to say, yeah, most likely, I mean, we have some high caliber players on the decks and like Joey showcased uh, as they were playing it out. Um, not, a lot of people are calling Golden Frieza basically the yellow Soul Striker. Um, it's a very advantageous deck, it has a ton of value, and yellow is such a phenomenal color in the game right now, having access to so many yeah. different tools. Talking about a broken tier one players, we have the, the Eggman and we have our winner of <laughs> the game. <laughs> My what's man. Up? Yo, what's up, Joe Crew? It is me and my boys hanging out here. Yo, thank you guys for doing the stream. Oh, oh wait a second. Thanks. You're on this side, you're on this side, you're on this side. Yeah. Oh my god, what the fuck is going on here? <laughs> no, well, but if anything, thank you for the phenomenal gameplay you got to showcase. Oh, in thanks, man. This round. I'm sorry I didn't catch those misplays. I should have known better. I just haven't played against that deck much. Yeah, that's a, taught me he, out of left Well, first of all, you had to be nervous to all get out. David Fujimaru, we, we know him as a West Coast. Oh, player. dude, man, like he and I have been talking for so long and like so many times over the last year, we were like, I cannot wait to play it. And the fact that like we were at table number six, six is my lucky number, I was born on six, six, Gemini, six man. Wow. We were at table number six, got to come on stream and like, you know. The stars aligned to make the game happen and the stars aligned to get you that win. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I saw, I definitely saw the heart of the cards. The, I, I believe my deck has a heart. I gave it a heart because I made it and it was beating and it showed me what I needed to see. Seeing that Xeno super combo off the uh, Vegeta top two, I mean, that was like, that, that saved me because I was tapped out and I was just hoping, you know, there was a way that I'd be able to untap and stay alive. So, of course, what is on everybody's mind in yeah. that game, too? That, that turn two, you used that Oceanus in the game. Yeah. Um, you had no idea if he was going to stop. You had no idea if he was going to attack seven more times. Yeah. He went with the ladder. How, how were you feeling as, as that turn progressed, as your life got smaller and his deck got smaller? So, my sensei, Miguel. Miguel, if you're out there watching, shout out to you, man. Um, he just has told me that the card is uh, Oceanus is such a good card. And more often than not, if somebody swings through Oceanus, they lose. You have usually 50 cards in your deck. By the time you set your life out and at the time you have your hand, you have less than 40 cards. In your so if you're milling every time off of Oceanus, you are thinning your deck so much. And not only are you thinning your deck, you're losing the things in your deck that make your deck work. So the combination of those two things and like working together makes it very difficult to come back after swinging through an Oceanus. And I think David knew that he shouldn't have swung through it. And after you know, he said he should have swung through it and he made the right decision on the second turn. Luckily, I had another Oceanus. I just sided to Oceanus. And uh, I knew since I was on the back end and the deck has an ability to kind of snap and go aggro, mm -hmm. I had to use what I could to just buy myself turns so I can set up. Because once blue sets up, I mean, yeah. I can do a lot with a little. You know? so, so what I'm hearing you say is after you saw the second one, you're yeah. like, I made the right decision. I'm feeling comfortable. And you had that comfortability through the entire game? Yeah, I think so. I felt a little not great when I tapped out on the second Oceanus because I was thinking if he had a way to push, I was tapped out and I did not really have a hand that could lift through it. Um, he he grabbed my Zeno super combo, which was the only other one that I had because I had played the one to arrival the Vegeta Kaba, which I think was the right play just to generate some pressure on the back end. I knew he was going to steal it. Um, but the first game would not have been as close if he didn't incorrectly steal my token. Yeah. I can say that for sure. Yeah. So going into your turn three, at this point, David has about eight cards left in deck. Yeah. In terms of winning the game, are you yeah. looking towards extending it to turns five, six, where you basically can't do anything? Or are you looking to put yourself stabilized in a position and then threaten him on both ends? One where you can take out his life or you can play the lion game and force him to mill himself out. I, I kind of put myself and him in a pickle simultaneous. Mm -hmm. So I kind of set it up so that like, if he swung through Oceanus the second turn, like, there was no way he was going to it's not possible, right? Yeah. So I forced him to pass. And that was kind of like my check, right? So the next turn I was seeing if I could open a checkmate, but I did not have what it took to checkmate. I didn't have a single Kefla in him. And um, I actually, when I paid to combo out of a swing, 
I had three energy up and I paid something to combo out at the end of the game. I can't quite remember, but had I left that energy up, it would have been game for sure. Because had I left that energy up, he tapped out to play the five drop and then he, he overall Bardock before. And if I had that energy up, I saw Kefla off my life and I saw Kefla off the top of my deck. Okay. I could have kefla and he wouldn't. It wouldn't have happened most of the time, but it just so happened. Right. Happen. Kefla, I, so I honestly think that my deck loves I put yeah. so much time into it. I've put so many games into it that, like, when I really want to see something, I feel like you guys have heard the phrase "the heart of the cards." Yeah, right? of course. Yeah. I don't think the heart of the cards means like you just get lucky. I think like when you create something, this is a creative game where we're putting energy into, we're putting our mana into a stack of cards that are made in Japan, are basically modern day Japanese woodblock printing. We have this cool deck box that we can bling out and. Being able to create something like that, putting our creative, as you can see, I like to make stuff. <laughs> putting our creative energy into something, you, you give it energy, you give it life. And uh, and the, the deck knows me, I know the deck. I've played hundreds of games with it now. I've been preparing nonstop with my senpai, Johnny Teo. And when I need something, more often than not, the deck will give it to me. It feels good. And not only do you put the, your heart into your deck and your deck building and your play, you've also been putting your heart into content lately. Definitely. And if you are a new player to this game, <laughs> I promise you, there is no one better to watch than Joe Poo. <laughs> Can you please so tell flattered. a little bit about the, the type of content you produce if somebody wanted to look you up? And yeah, stuff? I mean, you know, I really love opening packs of cards. I think that the art in this game is the thing that draws everybody into it. Whether you're a collector, whether you're a player, the thing that's going to get you in is the art. It is so beautiful. I've goose pimples just talking about this. <laughs> it's like the, 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 how beautiful this game is. It's not just, I mean, you're talking to a guy right now that used to, in third grade, have the internet dial up. And I would be looking up pictures of SS3 go tanks that would load like this, right? <laughs> and like, it would get to his eyes. I used to sit at my dad's desk and spin his chair around, like waiting, it's, like, it's more loaded, it's more loaded. And now we're in a world where, I mean, these cards, the art on these cards, the accessibility, the beauty, like the composition, the people that are putting this game together is just so gorgeous. <laughs> and the thing, the thing that I want to display is kind of show people how good this game looks and appreciate it from that standpoint and and just put positive energy into the community because there's a lot of people out there that'll be like oh that card's bad or this is bad or that's you know we don't need that any card is good in the right hands and the best thing is to bring people together and there's something positive that's beautiful and that's what we're doing today but we're gonna let you go we know you have yeah i think i have another round, round of five, too. so we wish you the best of luck thanks guys thank that's you so much yeah thanks for the opportunity thank you guys for doing what you do and thanks everybody watching the stream i'll see you on the joe crew shoku and maybe at the top tables <laughs> and we'll, we'll be back shortly for round five thank you all for your love and support see you guys thanks so much guys